Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today is the second part in our deep dive into the Prussian army. Now if you've seen the first part, you'll know that we did, well, from the Seven Years' War up until 1806, basically, because it was the same army. And in this part, we'll be looking at the army's performance in the Yenna campaign and looking at the reforms and changes that were made to the army afterwards. And we'll follow them up to the campaign of 1812. We'll be doing the rest of it in a third part to come later. The army that marched out to face Napoleon was large, very large. It had over 130,000 infantry, 40,000 cavalry, and over 10,000 artillerymen. It was so large that Prussia's high command saw fit to split the army into three. Now on paper this may seem to be a good plan, for was that not the keystone to the rapid manoeuvring of the French army? However, there was a difference. Whilst the French army was divided and had all the key elements of infantry, cavalry and artillery placed into reasonably similarly sized detachments, the Prussians did not do that. The first Prussian force, commanded by Karl Wilhelm, the Duke of Brunswick, consisted of 60,000 men and at least nominally he was the senior commander. There were 39,000 under Frederick Ludwig, a veteran of the Seven Years' War and usually known by his title... Hohenlohe, and 15,000 under Ernst von Ruschel. In practice, Brunswick was the senior, but hated by the far more popular Hohenlohe, and the two did not communicate well. Even Blücher wrote of Hohenlohe that, quote, he was a leader of whom the Prussian army might well be proud, end quote. This organisational structure had a serious problem, and it also meant that roles were duplicated. For example, there were three so-called chiefs of staff, all of whom had equal authority over the other two. Now, if the commander-in-chief overseeing this was strong and decisive, perhaps it could be made to work. However, as we saw in the first part, King Frederick Wilhelm III was not a strong man. In fact, he was a weak man, and he could not keep control of the egos of his three commanders. The campaign lasted exactly a month, and was decided by the twin battles of Jena Auerstadt. Napoleon engaged the army of Hohenlohe at Jena and believed it to be the main force, setting about to crush it. At the same time, Marshal Davout with his single corps took apart the main Prussian army under Brunswick, who was mortally wounded in the action, while von Ruschel marched to the sound of the guns but arrived far too late. Now I try to make the nations in these videos the heroes of their own story, but I'll be honest, in 1806 for Prussia it's incredibly hard to do. I will let Marshal Berthier's aide-de-camp, Baron Lejeune, describe the battle rather than do it myself. Now, remember this is going to be from the French perspective, okay? Quote, On October the 14th, 1806, just before sunrise, a thick fog came on and wrapped the whole district in gloom for several hours. The Emperor Napoleon wished to turn the darkness to account by delaying the action long enough to allow our reserves and cavalry to come up but the impatience of our troops led to the outpost opening fire on the enemy about 9 o'clock. The whole line followed the movement, emerging through wide openings, cleared and tested beforehand under Marshal Lan. The Prussians were also anxious to wait till the fog cleared away, but our attack roused them from their inaction, and their whole line also began to manoeuvre, changing front and marching upon Jena to their left. About 11 o'clock, we could see their infantry advancing and deployed with precision, whilst their artillery arrived at a gallop, at the head of an immense body of cavalry. When the two armies marching towards each other were nearly within musket shot, the 800 Prussian and French cannon simultaneously opened fire and exchanged salvos. The thunder of the terrible discharge dispersed the fog, and soon nothing intercepted the rays of the sun but the smoke, which reproduced above the heads of the combatants the ranks in which they stood. He continues, The whole army then engaged, and for some time the struggle was indecisive. But the Emperor, hearing that Marshal Ney and a portion of Murat's cavalry had come up, ordered a general attack. The shock was terrible. The Prussian cavalry, in their furious charge, shattered themselves upon our bayonets, and our grape shot and cavalry completed their destruction. The Prussian divisions were mingled in a confused mass, in which every ball from our guns struck down some hundred victims, whilst the forces of the enemy were divided. General Ruchel fled towards our left wing, and the King of Prussia turned towards Magdeburg. The fall of night put an end to the fighting, but not to the pursuit of the fugitives. 
and the victories of Jena and of Auerstadt, which Marshal Davou won the same day, left in our hands 200 flags with the Black Eagle and more than 40,000 prisoners, 500 pieces of artillery, with the baggage, pontoon trains and stores of the Prussians, who left 30,000 dead upon the field with an immense number of wounded. End quote. There is actually a plaster Jena in uh, Paris, which has a bronze column, which was made of the melted down cannons from Jena. I'll try and get a picture of it up if I can. I th- I'm fairly sure that it's from Jena. It might actually be the plaster Austerlitz, and it might be the cannons from Austerlitz. But I'm fairly sure it's Jena. Uh, I say fairly sure, 50-50. So... We saw there the Prussian cavalry, the vaunted, the fantastic, phenomenal Prussian cavalry, throwing itself against French squares. Now, it doesn't matter how good you are. If that, It's not about the quality of the cavalry in this case. It's about the quality of the square. And this army of 1806, this is the Grand Armée that has just won Austerlitz. It's one of the most highly trained armies the world has ever seen. Those squares are never going to break. The Prussians completely destroyed in that one day. And the campaign itself was over shortly afterwards. The same crowds that had cheered Queen Louise and her dragoons as they passed down unto de Linden only weeks before now cheered Napoleon as he passed through the central passage of the Brandenburg Gate, an area previously reserved solely for the use of the Prussian king. Now, I said in the last video that Napoleon didn't fate Davout for his victory, and that was completely wrong. I I don't know why I... uh, (laughs) why I misspoke there. He did, of course, he named him the Duke of Auerstadt, and he allowed Davu's corps to lead the triumph into Berlin. While some splinter of the elements of the Prussian army fought on in eastern Prussia, after sort of joining up with the Russians, Prussia as a nation at war was done. In the introduction to his work, the Prussian army 1808 to 1815, David Nash wrote, quote, After the disaster of 1806, there was a widespread sense of outrage at the way in which the Prussian army had been humiliated. Public and political pressures caused the King, Frederick William III, to make some move towards setting up a board of inquiry to determine the causes of defeat and with the wider object of reforming the army. The first steps towards these objectives were taken in July 15, 1807, when the King requested Graf Lottum and Major General von Scharnhorst to head the newly established Military Reorganisation Commission. Under their influence, the places within the commission were soon filled with a mixture of reactionaries and visionaries, including Conan von Massenbusch, von Borstel, von Bronikowski, and more significantly, Boyen, Gneisnau, and a young captain of artillery named von Clauschwitz. After the merciless destruction of her army, Prussia stood humiliated. First on the field, then at Tilsit, the peace treaty that would be signed a year later between the emperors Napoleon and Alexander. King Frederick was notified of the terms, but not included in the discussions. This was a particular slap in the face as Prussia lost a lot of territory, not least of which the Duchy of Warsaw, the embers of a new Polish state. After the Convention of Paris, further humiliations were piled upon Prussia, including, and stop me if if you've heard this one before, the French imposing a limit to the number of soldiers that the army could possess. It was either 38,000 or 42,000. I've, I've heard both numbers. I can imagine it being something like 32, uh, 38,000 plus you know people who don't count on the official rolls, so that would be 42,000, something like that. And it was clear, though, that reform needed to happen, both of the state and of the army. Whilst Heinrich Stein and Karl Hardenberg reformed the state, bringing it into the modern era, one of our Napoleonic figures, General von Scharnhorst, well, he wasn't a general at that point, but von Scharnhorst put his considerable talent behind reorganising the army and maximising the possibilities that this cap on the number of soldiers allowed in the army could have. By clever accounting, the army got down to about 45,000 men, organized into six brigades they never quite got down to the 38,000 but yeah it was close enough and they were organized into six brigades the east prussia the west prussia the upper silesia the lower silesia and the pomerania and brandenburg brigades now these were called brigades and we think of uh, say a french brigade of being maybe two regiments with six battalions in 
No, 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 no. These are closer to divisions. Each brigade having six to nine battalions of infantry, twelve squadrons of cavalry, and various supporting artillery elements. In 1808, the newly organised Ministry of War set out a new organisation for infantry regiments, which consisted of three battalions of four companies each, with these battalions often numbering about 600 men in the field. Unlike many other nations, all battalions were field battalions, with the first two in each regiment being classed as musketeers and the third as fusiliers. While skirmishing tactics were now taught to all soldiers, it was these fusiliers that would be expected to fight both formed and skirmish. So it's a really interesting, unique thing, I think, for the Napoleonic era. We've often got grenadier companies in a regiment, but this is like a light infantry element in the regiments. These fusiliers, so the, the, the main line infantry is something that's confused me for a long time. You've got musketeers and fusiliers. Musketeer, regular line infantry, fusiliers, sort of light infantry. Along with the reforms to the organisation, there was reforms to service for Prussian personnel also. The brutality of treatment of soldiers went out, gone with the floggings and particularly the running of the gauntlet. And a lower length of enlistment was introduced, cutting the previous 10 years of service requirement to three. By the end of 1808, the previously mentioned Ministry of War was established, and all of this was done under the eyes of the French diplomats and spies, which makes it particularly considerable. One thing that would have a considerable effect on the Prussians and later German armies when the, was the introduction of something called, I think it's a great name, the Krumper system, which would lead to another confusing thing when we get to later war, and that's why I left this nation until last, because it's pretty confusing. To be honest, it's weird, the Krumper system. It's a little bit like Switzerland conducts their national service today it's basically a one in one out system so a cadre of young local men would be called up the number set between three and five men per company per month so this meant that an army had five thousand men and a year later having been trained they were discharged so the ones who'd been called up three years before would have been discharged so this meant that each company would recruit up to 60 new men per month while a 60 that had been recently discharged skill, still had the skills and training that they had when they were discharged. This rolling recruitment meant that up to 150,000 men were trained, ready to roll, but not included in the official numbers of the army. Later, by 1813, discharged men did not even completely leave the army, but would become members of the reserve battalions, which were attached to a parent regiment. These reserve battalions were officered by NCOs and members of the parent regiment, very much in the way that the Territorial Army in the UK works. Well, what well, I did in the early 2000s, I'm not really sure what um, how it works now. But yeah, that's that's a little bit further ahead. We'll talk about that in the next in the next video. So basically, it would be a rolling recruitment. You were, every month you would have three to five men in, three to five men out, and it meant that there was a huge number of trained men, which weren't officially part of the army but they still had that skills and training. Now, perhaps most importantly for the Prussian army in the post-1806 era, there was a massive clear-out of the old and bold. Of 143 generals that were on the rolls in 1806, by 1813, only Blücher and Bogislav von Tauentzien remained. While there were still some relics knocking about in 1812, and we'll talk about them in the next uh, the next episode. This goes to show that the root and branch reform of the officer cadre to get rid of um, what we're we talking about to get rid of 141 generals was uh, <laughs> was pretty extreme. Now this was not without its controversy though. There were some old school generals such as von York who opposed these reforms, thinking that they had the whiff of revolution about them. It was whilst Prussia was in the midst of this reorganisation that the French Emperor called upon his nations to raise a grand armée for the invasion of Russia. Now, officially an ally of France, Prussia was required to provide troops for the invasion. Troops that would form the northern wing of his strike into Russia. On paper, its objective was the capital at St. Petersburg. But realistically, 
it was merely there to guard for any forces that were landed in the north, particularly by the British. While Napoleon demanded 30,000 men, ultimately it would be a shade over 20,000 that formed the northernmost wing of the army. The Prussians had in total 12 infantry so-called composite regiments. Now, so-called because while they used the regimental structure we talked about earlier on, two musketeer and one fusilier battalions, these battalions would be taken from different regiments, from the different parent regiments. Now, that's really good because it allows us a great variety, and it means as war gamers, we can paint up a load of different facings and still have you know, the army that invaded Russia in 1812. So we can have those different colours and different facings on the battlefield. I think that's really handy. But basically what I mean is, if for argument's sake, the Musketeers came from the Berlin Regiment. I'm just making up names of regiments here. If the Musketeers came from, the first battalion came from the Berlin Regiment. The second one came from the Munich Regiment. And the Fusiliers came from the Bonn Regiment, for argument's sake. So while they fought together as a regiment, they actually were sourced from different regiments. Now it was decided on which battalions would go by Wilhelm that they would draw lots to see who went. Now ostensibly this was to spread the experience throughout the army but the fact that it was lots and not voluntary you know put your name in a hat who wants to go it was literally everyone's in there made me think that maybe the regiments weren't super happy about going to get this experience. Uh, the guards stayed at home, which is another thing that makes me think they weren't super happy about it. Uh, but the cavalry was also raised in a similar way to the infantry, sending three Hussar, two Dragoon, and one Lancer composite regiment into Russia. They were accompanied by four foot batteries and two horse artillery batteries, which is actually quite a high ratio uh, compared to the rest of the army, in my opinion. But because they were composite regiments... They were simply numbered in typical Germanic efficiency. Infantry Regiment number one, Hussar Regiment number three, etc. Now, that's one of the things I've always found a little bit boring, I'll be honest. And it's also why I think they're a bit boring when playing Black Powder. Let's be honest. When you're issuing an order, the King's own Yorkshire Light Infantry will advance two moves. To me, is a lot more interesting and cooler than Infantry Regiment number four will go forward a bit. So, yeah, no, anyway, anyway, that, that, that's just my bias coming through. Well, let's head back to the army. So, as well as having these composite regiments, the ultra-conservative von York was made commander of the Prussian army. Uh, I'm not sure if that was at Napoleon's insistence, but I'm fairly sure Napoleon would have had the final say in who was going to lead this contingent. Now, he had railed against the reforms, saying that if the old ways were good enough for Frederick the Great... Then they were good enough now. But unfortunately, he was a bit of a dinosaur. War had changed around him and he refused to evolve. So while I said that I think Napoleon would have had the final say, I think the argument could have been made to him that, you know, oh yes, here is our most gallant, our most experienced general to lead our army at your side into Russia. When in fact, he was a bit of an old fuddy-duddy and he didn't want to risk actually someone useful and maybe even not give Napoleon someone that good in the hope that they would lose. I find that unlikely because you wouldn't want to lose your own army. But uh, you necessarily wouldn't send Blücher or someone really good, I guess. Now, the Prussians managed to avoid doing too much fighting, being on the wing. Uh, and uh, to be honest, they weren't really into the war in the first place. So I don't think they were particularly going out looking for them. But one notable action took place at Gros Ekau, which is also called the Battle of Mesotina. Now, this is actually a scenario in Clash of Eagles, uh, and it's a really good one. It can be played out in an evening. It's not, not very big. It's a really cool little scenario, actually. And the Russian army had advanced towards what is now Latvia and occupied several key strategic areas, and it was against these that the Prussians attacked. Now, as with the Battle of Jena, we've got an excellent eyewitness account of the battle, written by the local parish priest, no less, at the time, a Karl Ernst Heinrich. Now, he wrote in the church books the following information, and it includes a couple of little details that you don't normally get in these main histories. So I really like that. I thought I would be... Uh, I thought I'd add it in. So the Russian troops had been in position for several days, and it was on a Sunday, specifically the third Sunday after Trinity Sunday, that the Prussians made their attack. Uh, 
At the start of the battle, the pastor was in the process of conducting three baptisms. The local population ran to him to take shelter in the church's cellars. He wrote that the Prussians advanced from the so-called French cops, with their main attack directed at the garden next to the church and the pastorate. Damage from cannon fire to the church steeple and vestry, which now has a description saying 7th of July 1812, are also evidence of the battle, as are the two projectiles that buried themselves in the wall of the tavern. The most violent clash was at the pastorate's garden and the cops next to the pastorate, the cops being, quote, dug up by enemy projectiles. So, it's, <laughs> so it sounds like the poor old pastor was doing some, uh, some ha- nice happy baptisms when suddenly the Prussians started attacking. Now, despite the pastor saying that it was the Prussians who attacked, actually the opposite was the case. It was the Russians who attacked the Prussians, seeing that they outnumbered them quite significantly. However, what the Russians didn't know is that there were Prussian reinforcements on the way, and soon the Prussians were able to put together a counter-attack that forced the Russians back. One unit that was isolated were the Revelski Musketeer Regiment, so these are Russians, and they found themselves in line charged by the Prussian Dragoon Regiment No. 2. After a sharp and vicious melee, Vachmeister Ribbon E. Sioux and Gefreiter Buthner of the 1st Squadron, formerly of the 2nd West Prussian Dragoon Regiment, carried off their colours. Now, this is particularly notable because it was the only colour the Russians lost in the entire campaign. Now, given that even... The like a crushing victory for the French, like Austerlitz, still cost them an eagle. For the Russians to only lose one colour in the entire campaign is no small thing. And as a rather fun aside, I think it's fun anyway, the colour was only returned to the Russians in 1834 in exchange for a Prussian flag that the Russians had captured during the Seven Years' War. So I, I just thought that was a nice little, little fun bit of information there. This cavalry, the cavalry that had captured the colour of the Revelski Musketeers, were in turn rushed by a battalion of the Russian 34th Jaeger, who drove the cavalry off, and in turn nearly captured the colour of the Dragoons, its rescue being down to the standard bearer, Farnrich von Osfeld. Now, he'd been hit by a musket ball, which severely wounded him and threw him off his horse. On the ground and in the chaos of the melee, he wrapped the flag around himself and crawled away, helped by Dragoner Prass. So, you know, a a trooper, press. Eventually, the Russians were forced back and the field belonged to the Prussians. Now, there are some more um, details here that I'm just going to put in. It doesn't really mean anything on the greatest history of the Prussian army, but they're a little bit fun, so I quite like them. Now, to the north of the pastorate were buried 50 fallen soldiers, and later the grave was surrounded with poplars, which grew to a large size, but were uprooted by a storm of the 8th of July, 1848. Yulia, the wife of Pastor Kuhn, planted a pine tree on the grave in 1862. The greater part of those killed were buried in the woods of Rag and next to Echow Mill. Of officers killed, the following was recorded in the church records by the pastor we talked about earlier on. Matvey Kiselev, captain of the 4th Jaeger Regiment, 43 years old and native of Chernigov province. He was killed at the gate of the pastorate by an enemy round which tore his right arm off. This is also where Major... Kunetsov fell, wounded by an enemy projectile. He was taken to Borsk, where he died in the lazarette on 22nd July. Young officer Prince Bagration was killed at the Samson Tavern and his body taken to Riga. Now, I'm, I'm not sure who the Prince Bagration was. Certainly not the Prince Bagration, but maybe a relative or maybe the passengers got it wrong. But he also goes on to write, On the Prussian side, during the Battle of the 7th of July, there were killed... Rittmeister von Essenbeck of the 1st Dragoon Regiment, buried in the woods at Rag, and Lieutenant von Wallis, buried at the Eckau Mill. Now, that's a different date here to the one that we saw on the plaque, and that's obviously due to the change in dates between the Caesarian and the Gregorian calendar. Now, the road to Riga after this victory was open, and the Prussians advanced to it. But it soon became clear that St. Petersburg wasn't a viable target. So they basically chilled out in what's now the Estonian capital, Riga, and they just hung out there for a while. When the French abandoned the invasion in the winter and the infamous retreat from Moscow occurred, the Prussians also began to fall back. Not west or south to link up with the French, 
but basically through the northern parts of Central Europe, and at an incredibly slow pace, until they were caught up by the Russians. Not putting up any resistance, they flipped and were soon joining the Tsar's forces to march on East Prussia. This was almost a done deal, and one which Napoleon couldn't really help see coming, to be honest. While he might have foolishly expected a little more from the Austrians, because, you know, he was married to an Austrian archduchess, he couldn't really expect any loyalty whatsoever from the Prussians. Now, Black Powder covers the Prussian army incredibly well for this period, the period of 1812, in the Clash of Eagles. So I won't repeat, I won't really go through them there. The best I can say is, get the book, because it's really, really good for the Prussians. They've got quite a large section in it. So Napoleon and the French army had been shattered by this Russian campaign. The Napoleonic Wars were entering a new phase, one of French retreat pursued by furious Russian, Austrian and Prussian armies. The Prussians, and Gebhard von Blücher in particular, were unstinting in their attacks on the French, and not least because the war was being fought on Prussian soil. While the last time war had visited these lands in 1806, a month-long blitzkrieg saw it finished. Now it would be a grinding conflict that would stretch on for two years in order to meet these challenges, and now free of the punitive French terms of Tilsit and the Convention of Paris, Prussia would call upon those tens of thousands of trained men, and, after a later 1813 reform, she would be ready to rise to the pinnacle of European powers. We will be discussing the battles of Prussia and the battles of France in the next episode, as the Prussians march on the road to Waterloo. All that and more in the third part of our deep dive into the Prussian army.